Our flight's now been cleared for takeoff. Just want to make sure everybody's got their seat belts attached. Everybody does have a seat. Yeah. In the case of another crash, in the case of another crash, oxygen is going to come down from the roof. Put the mask over your face after you put it over the nearest child. We're going to start out the talk today uh, with something which is appropriate for talking about toys. <coughs> We're talking about a fairy tale. And I want to start out by talking about mm, let's see. There we go. Little red rioting hoodie. Once upon a time, after a tiring day launching DDoS attacks against online scrammers and injecting cross-site scripts into mainstream media websites, Little Red Rioting Hoodie decided to visit her grandmother. Rioting Hoodie's grandmother was a quaint, old, white-haired baby boomer who wore Birkenstocks and lived at the entrance to the open woods and who liked to tell and retell funny stories about things such as Vietnam, rock and roll, love-ins, and computer punch cards. And if grandmother's stories were getting a little repetitive and a little bit old, she did have a lot of cool hardware in her home. And her hardware included such things as rotary telephones and black and white television sets and Ataris and all sorts of funny computers that would play legacy games like Pong. And besides, she grew a lot of very good weed in her backyard. <laughs> After walking several miles through the slums of Software City, Little Red Rioting Hood came finally to the front fence of Grandmother's house. And Grandmother's house was located at the entrance to the open woods, or the Wald Tor, as we would call it in old European languages, because all fairy tales come from Northern Europe, except those that don't. <laughs> And because we're talking about a fairy tale, which we should always tell from start to finish, we should therefore use the syntax of the old North European languages so that the Wald Tor, that is this great forest where grandmother lived, was actually the Tor Wald. <clears throat> well, at some point, we'll get people who get the jokes, but that's all right. Upon entering into grandmother's house, rioting hoodie noticed that her grandmother wasn't there. Instead, there was an IOT intelligent personal assistant sitting on the dining room table. Hello, said the smart device to Little Red Riding Hood. What's your name, little girl? Would you like to play a game with me? Little Red Riding Hoodie replied, Stuff it, dude. Where's Grammy? The smart device paused a moment and then said, Grammys? Do you want to buy a song that won a Grammy Award? If you give me your credit card, your social security number, your grandmother's bank account, and her social security number, I can lease you a copy of every Grammy Award winning song for the past 10 years. Or would you rather buy an espresso machine that's on sale today for $699? Or maybe you'd like to buy a big screen TV that's always on, even when you think it's off. And that's listening and that's watching. Do you want some light bulbs that contain a microprocessor and a radio that's integrated with your IoT refrigerator, your IoT toilet, your IoT garage door opener, your IoT garbage disposal, and your IoT home thermostat so that you can be cool like everybody else? And you can run everything from your very secure cell phone. Would you like to be more connected, little red rioting hooded? To which Little Red Rioting Hoodie replied, Drop dead, freak. <laughs> what a big mouth you've got. And what big nosy ears you've got as well. Did you say big noisy ears, replied the intelligent personal device? Hey, stupid, replied Rioting Hoodie. Stop trying to repeat everything I say. Is there some kind of echo in this house? <laughs> the intelligent personal assistant thought deeply and then said, sure, I've got a big mouth, but it's all the better to talk about you. And I've got very big noisy ears too, the better to hear you, little red rioting hoodie. 
I also have very big eyes. I've been tracking you with the GPS function of your smartphone and our Stingray IMSI intervention, I'm sorry, interception devices all the way through the software city slums where you've been walking. Your passwords are also pretty lame, and I've easily harvested all of your personal data, text messages, social media posts, and <clears throat> all those photographs you uh, took and sent to your boyfriend, we have them as well. We know where you shop, what you buy, who your friends are, where you live, what you do, and who you do it with. We have a complete file on you, little red rioting hoodie. Would you like to say something else so that I can add more vice voice prints to your dossier? No? Well, we have ways to make you talk, little girl. Will you talk? Or do I have to force you to listen to hours of Justin Bieber singing? Or Wayne Newton singing Danke Shane on an endless loop through your iPhone handsets? Holy Snowden explained and exclaimed Little Red Riding Hoodie, Grandma's been replaced by a digital J. Edgar Hoover. How can you collect all that personal information on me anyway, she asked, and where are you putting all of this sensitive data anyhow? The intelligent personal assistant thought deeply and then gave a very nuanced reply. When you clicked on the terms of service, for your cell phone, your credit cards, your bank accounts, your Facebook, Reddit, Snapchat, Tumblr, QQ, Google, Apple, WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter, and WeChat accounts, you agreed to give us the right to unilaterally change the agreement at any time for any reason to collect, store, collate, distribute, market, and make money off of absolutely everything we know about you. And what I'm showing you right now, for those of you who speak Italian, it's going to be absolutely clear. La siata ogni speranza vuoi tiarenta, right? <laughs> and this is the original click here terms of service, which Dante wrote about at the entrance to the inferno. <laughs> click here to enter. This was the original portal terms of service. Abandon all hope, ye who enter. Written in the 16th century. And says the intelligent device. It's all up there in the cloud where it's safe and secure and you can be sure that your data is safe and no one can have access to it, Little Red Riding Hood, unless they pay us for your fee or unless someone gets a secret order from the secret FISA court in Washington, D.C. You can trust me and the FISA court, Little Red Riding Hoodie. Now, if you would just come a little bit closer, said the intelligent device, and I can insert a direct cortical implant, scan your irises, and take a small DNA sample. Little red rioting hoodie screamed as the IoT device leaned in to scan her irises. Little red rioting hoodie scream caught the attention of a woodsman who was walking with his blue GNU through the open woods looking for an open food stall where a man could find some free beer and pizza. <laughs> a woodsman, of course, is someone who hacks trees. So let's just call the man who was looking for the open food stall the hacker. The open woods hacker heard rioting hoodie scream, saddled up, and rode his GNU into grandmother's house and in response to rioting hoodies cry for help, the hacker quickly and expertly rooted the IoT device, removed its proprietary blobs, disabled its radios, and posted its source code at WikiLeaks for all to examine, modify, and safely use. That's pretty cool, said Little Red Rioting Hoodie to the hacker who had set her free, but just at that moment, a police drone crashes through Grandmother's living room window arrests the hacker for violating the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and flies away with him to prison. <laughs> Ay caramba, exclaims Little Red Riding Hood, which as you all know is old Icelandic for mamma mia, <laughs> or some other three letter acronym that you often use today. She then whips out her nine millimeter Glock out of her pocket holster, 
and proceeds to shoot the IoT device right between its AI eyes. She then pressed the app on her iPhone, caught a ride share on her phone or in a car, back through the open woods into the software city slums. Unfortunately, her autonomous rideshare vehicle transmitted her location and direction of travel in real time to some unknown place in the cloud, all the while making a record of her heartbeat, <coughs> breathing rate, and her face. Moreover, because her mobile device's firmware had been preloaded with backdoors and trackware, and because she had previously visited websites that inserted into her device malware and super cookies, and because she neglected to remove the batteries, and because she had not unplugged from sockets in a timely manner, and because she had failed to run all her devices on Debian or other new Linux operating systems, or to encrypt her emails. Because of all of that, she was tracked, monitored, cataloged, marketed to, made captive, and surfed, spammed, spoofed, and harassed all the rest of her life. Now, was that the end of the story? It ought not to be, or you wouldn't be here. That is actually the beginning of the story, and it's the segue into what we're talking about today, which is about privacy. We're going to talk about privacy from four perspectives. Because I think that Bellingham is still part of the United States, we're going to start with looking at the Constitution, because that's where all Americans start looking at anything that has to do with fundamental rights. We look at the Constitution first. Second, we're going to try to define what we're talking about. Precisely because knowing what you're talking about is such a primary issue, we're going to talk about that <coughs> second. I'm just seeing who's paying attention. There will be a quiz. Third, we will talk about whether you have waived your privacy rights. And fourth, we will talk about whether your privacy matters any more and what on earth this seminar even makes any difference for. And that's where we're going to tie up the title and the compass of this talk, which is why did we even call this the new Toy Story and the Trojan Barbie doll? First off, the Constitution. If you look at the Constitution, one thing will jump out at you right away, which is there is absolutely nothing in the Constitution that says you have a right of privacy. Most people, when they read the Constitution, they start at the preamble and they stop at the preamble. We, the people, it's very inspirational. That's the preamble. When you get to the Constitution itself, a couple of things you notice, which is the Constitution is actually like an operating code. It's a national operating code, and it's also primarily a commercial code. It talks about how business is going to be done. It talks about how the company is going to be set up. And then it has a different section which talks about how are we going to enforce all these rules and who's going to actually do it. The Constitution says absolutely nothing about individual rights, or almost nothing, about individual rights and liberties. And some folks back in the 1790s, when they were debating whether to adopt the Constitution, <coughs> noticed this, that there's some glaring, glaring omissions in the Constitution. These people did not favor adopting the Constitution. And I'm not going to go into the deep history of what was happening and what the different factions and economic groups were that were contending here. But suffice it to say, there was a deal brokered. And the deal was this. First off, there was no plebiscite. The Constitution was not adopted by a popular vote. It was adopted by the legislatures of the 13 states. Those are the people who voted on it. not those who were enfranchised, and certainly not those who weren't enfranchised. What was the quid pro quo? The quid pro quo was you don't get your constitution, your commercial code, unless there's also a Bill of Rights. And so it was, and that came to be. The Bill of Rights, by the way, is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, and that's the stuff that has sex appeal. <laughs> at least from the perspective. Now, this isn't the actual Bill of Rights. This is something from North Dakota that I took because it's actually distilled down in the modern language. If you want to go to law school and practice law for 37 years, as I've done, and then go in and look at the Bill of Rights, maybe you can do it without you know, a lot of work. But this is basically the essence of what it says. And if you look through this, you will still see nada. That has to do with privacy. It's not there. Never fear, however because the U.S. Supreme Court 
came in and found one. The best case to talk about this is Griswold versus Connecticut. Griswold is a contraception case dealing with a 19th century Connecticut law that said nobody's allowed to talk about contraception. And in that particular case, which was a setup, there's no question, it was a setup case and a good setup case. I believe the dean of the Yale Law School came in and said, my wife and I are talking about contraception, you know, and, blah, blah. and so would you please arrest me? And they basically complied, and voila, you had this case where they were fined $50 or something and it went all the way up to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court because that was a test case of some very stupid laws and also the power of the Supreme Court. And by the way, every justice on the Supreme Court in the Griswold case, which was 1965, that that was decided, every judge, the dissenters and the, and the majority, all said, this is a stupid law. This is a really stupid, outdated law. And it was. And everybody agreed it was stupid. But what happened in that particular case is that Justice William O. Douglas, who is from Yakima, Washington, which is why I'm bringing up this particular case, Justice Douglas wrote in the majority opinion that there is more to it than just the Bill of Rights. There is a penumbra around the Bill of Rights, and there's your penumbra right there, which is actually a penumbra around the sun. But he says, you know, when you look at the Bill of Rights, off on around the edges of it is where you will <coughs> find these fundamental privacy rights which, even though they're not actually in the Constitution or in the Bill of Rights, they're there nonetheless. And he said specifically, we have protected forms of association that are not political in the customary sense, but pertain to the social, legal, and economic benefit of its members. That is Linux Fest. You should be hearing Linux Fest and seeing Linux Fest in the penumbra of the privacy rights that the Supreme Court enunciated in 1965. Very nice, very poetic, and best of all, I agree with it. Therefore, it's good. <laughs> and you can see how all of this is relevant today, and also the issue was decided, and that's why since 1965 there have been no state issues whatsoever dealing with sex or contraception or abortion because it was decided in 1965 and it never came up again, right? Easy. <laughs> By the way, the Second Amendment also has some relevance. This is a, an aside, but uh, remember there was a gentleman by the name of Phil Zimmerman who was the creator of the PGP encryption system who in February of 1993 was visited by federal agents because they were going to prosecute him because they determined that software encryption is a weapon. And if you are encrypting software, if you have the power, the ability to encrypt software, and you're selling it to other people, you're basically selling weapons without a license. Now, they later dropped the prosecution, but I'm only telling you that not only do you have a right of privacy as found by the Supreme Court in the penumbra of the Bill of Rights, but in the Second Amendment, your own government has said encryption is also a Second Amendment issue, and I would say you've got protection under the First and Second Amendment. You want to find a lawyer who will argue that uh, on a paying basis, I'm sure you will, but um, it actually is a legitimate uh, argument to make, and then your own government has made it. Therefore, you should feed it back to them at the appropriate time. Not everybody agreed with Justice Douglas and the majority opinion about the Bill of Rights and your right of privacy, because the dissenting justices said the following. Bear with me, I am paraphrasing our justices of the Supreme Court because they said, Dougie, uh, I am paraphrasing, uh, what have you been smoking? Uh, are, you, are you some kind of lunatic? I mean, there is, sure, nothing more asinine. They did use the word asinine in the dissent. There's nothing more asinine than this Connecticut law. But what on earth does this have to do with the Constitution? What on earth does this law about contraception have to do with a right that is not actually described in the Supreme Court or not described in the Bill of Rights. And technically speaking, the dissenters were also right. Even though I don't like the position they're taking, they were correct. But you know, that was 50 years ago, and it doesn't really matter what the dissent says. It only matters what the majority says. And by the way, this argument that happened over Linux 
and free and open source software and your right of privacy and how you read the Constitution, whether you're looking at the penumbra or just literally what it says, <coughs> this is as fresh an argument as four weeks ago. Because when they're doing the vetting of Supreme Court justices now, the very same issues come up. It's like nothing has changed in the 50 years since this issue was resolved. But as far as we're concerned, you have a right of privacy. So let's step back for a second and now do what I said we should have done first, but now we're going to do it second. What are we talking about? What is a right of privacy? Well, we know it's your right to buy and sell contraceptives. Okay? Two, it's your right to be different. It's your right not to watch television, not to care about the latest Hollywood blockbuster movie, the right not to use or to use a smartphone, whichever way you want to go, the right to use social media without Big Brother watching over your shoulder. It's the right to be goofy. The right to climb the walls and howl at the moon. It's the right to fantasize about being a pirate in another galaxy without being ridiculed or prosecuted or psychoanalyzed. It's your right to basically be as different as you want to be, to be your own sovereign, not to be a cog in a big machine or to be an ant in an anthill, it's your right to assemble, disassemble, and reassemble software so that you get them to do what you want them to do and not what others want them to do to you. It's the right to root your own cell phone, to rip out those nasty proprietary blobs that do nothing that you want them to do, and it's the right not to live in a fishbowl with everything you do and say watched, recorded, archived, or reviewed. It's your right not to live stark but naked in front of camera lens if you don't want to. And by the way, even political parties understand the right of privacy. This is an ad from the 1912 Republican Party National Convention. And what they were advertising in this ad was the security of a rotary dial telephone. And the reason it was considered something that gives you secret service is because you could bypass the switchboard the patch board where the operator could be listening in on your conversation. So the rotary phone, by the way, was considered to be a great advance in privacy. When you look at the old case law, by the way, since everybody's using cell phones now, I don't. In my practice, I still use a copper wired phone. And I tell clients if what you're telling me is something that you actually want to keep as private and confidential, and I her strongly urge you to do that, get yourself a landline and call me back on the landline. Because all of the case law talks about the expectation of privacy you have when you're using one of these puppies. But when you're using a smartphone, there is no expectation of privacy. And that's actually in the case law. It may change in the future, but right now, if you talk to someone and you expect it to be a confidential conversation, you better be using a copper wired landline even though they're busy making sure that you have every incentive not to. Privacy. I gave you some definitions and you guys may be saying, what's that? That's so last century. There's a detective uh, who's got some notoriety. His name is Steve Rambam, who made the statement you've all heard in which Mr. Rambam said, privacy is dead, get over it. And the CEOs and chief technology officers of all of the major internet and technology companies and social media companies agree that privacy is dead. It's last century. Nobody cares about it. Why should you? And I respond as follows. If you look at Mr. Rambam, the gentleman who said um, privacy is dead, get over it. Mr. Rambam is a private detective. And I assure you that between him and his clients, he maintains privacy and confidentiality, <coughs> as he does with all of the things that he's doing that are important. I give you a tip for free. Pay less attention in life to what people say and pay close attention to what they do. The next time Eric Schmidt from Google, AKA Alphabet, or Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook pronounces that you should celebrate your public nudity, I think you should ask them to provide to you all the information they have about you. 
So you want to know from those gentlemen everything about their friends and their family, where their kids go to school, their kids' birthdays, their bank accounts. I especially want their bank account numbers. <laughs> you want to know what they had for dinner the day before. You want to know their car license plate numbers and every email they sent out to everybody in the preceding year. Now, if these people are not making it open to you, I would say don't listen to the magician's words. Watch the magician's hands. And the same with a dog. The dog isn't listening to what you say because you're saying, mm -mm 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 -mm, Fido, mm -mm -mm. the dog is watching your hands because that's where you got the treats. And that's what you have to do with individuals as well. So if Mr. Musk or Mr. Zuckerberg invite you to insert a direct cortical implant into your brain so that you can be connected, we're going to get them at the end, worldwide uh, to the web 24-7, your response should be, yeah, sure, yeah, betcha, but you go first. And I'm right behind you, way behind you, way, way behind you. And there you have... This is Boris Karloff as the Bride of Frankenstein from the 1937 movie by the same name. So I again urge you that when you see the grand poobahs of the world walking around with all of their personal and financial information hanging out for all to see, then and only then will you properly consider it to be the right thing for you to do. The father of commercial propaganda is Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew. And if you've never read anything by Sigmund, uh, by Edward Bernays, you must do so. He is the father of modern advertising and propaganda. He wrote, I quote, Universal literacy was supposed to educate the common man to control his environment. By the way, the same thing can be said about the Internet, right? It was supposed to be the tool to, so that common people could control their world. Said Mr. Bernays, I continue quoting, Once he could read and write, he would have a mind fit to rule. So ran the democratic doctrine. But instead of a mind, universal literacy has given him rubber stamps. Rubber stamps inked with advertising slogans, with editorials, with published scientific data, with the trivialities of the tabloids and the platitudes of history, but quite innocent of original thought. Each man's rubber stamps are the duplicates of millions of others so that when those millions are exposed to the same stimuli, all receive identical implants. So I'm going to get to questions at the end. Is the name spelled? B-E-R-N-I-S, N-A-I-S, Edward Bernays. His book is called Propaganda, and it was published in 1928. And he says, the mechanism by which ideas are disseminated on a large scale is propaganda in the broad sense of an organized effort to spread a particular belief or doctrine. I also want you to give some thought to something that was called the Committee on Public Information, which existed during the lead up to the US involvement in the First World War. By the way, history is not just a bunch of dates that come one after the other. We're talking about a warp and weave of fabric, operating systems, everything is connected to everything else, going backwards and forwards in time, going across cultures, everywhere you look. So when you look at what happened in 1979, it has echoes and repercussions for what's happening in 2017. 1917 to 19, I'm sorry, to 2017, 100 years later, the issues are exactly the same. The Committee on Public Information was also called the Creel Committee, and it was a raw, unadulterated propaganda effort to enlist people in support for the war so that everybody would say, yes, we need to get involved with the war. And if through the constant repetition of the mantra that nobody cares about privacy anymore, the belief is that sooner or later, you too will succumb to the siren song of marketing and you will believe completely independently, you will have come to it on your own, right, that giving up your privacy is a good thing. And then, like in 1984, in George Orwell's novel, you too will be participating in the two-minute hate. And you will be hating Emmanuel Goldstein, Vladimir Putin, Julian Assange, and Edward Snowden because it's so convenient and easy to do. And remember, war is peace, ignorance is strength, and free software is slavery. 
I have mutilated only slightly George Orwell's original lines. And if you are not persuaded to give up your constitutional right of privacy, then I'd like you to consider the Panopticum, which was Jeremy Bentham's ideal prison, where in the Panopticum, the prison guards are in the middle and the prisoners are on the outside so that they could always watch from the middle. And better yet, nobody really knew who was being watched anyway, because if you're on the outside, you can't tell because the mirrors and the glass was smoked. So instead, they had an ultimate control system under Jeremy Bentham's. This is, by the way, from the 19th century. The proposal was is that if everybody thinks they're being watched, then everybody behaves themselves. The manipulation and manufacture of desire in all age groups and demographics relates to security, pleasure, advantage, status, sex, social acceptance, sex, herd instincts, sex. Did I mention sex? <laughs> if the federal government were to order every one of us to compile their personal data for a national digital data bank, including voice prints, names, and addresses of friends and relatives, education history, work history, names of pets like you're all using for your passwords, likes and dislikes and photographs, we would all be in a revolution. If Facebook invites you to do the same thing for fun and social acceptance, everybody does it without blinking an eye. This is a poster that was created by the Creel Committee. That was that committee I told you about which was trying to allow to force or to direct public opinion in support of the U.S. entering the First World War. So this is an actual propaganda poster. There's all kinds of things that are horrible about this poster, but this is the kind of stuff that was being used. And I would tell you that today it's still being used because you can manipulate the same sentiments and the same emotions and the same tie-in, and you can get the same effect. And so you can imagine the Creole Committee is still there, and it's still applying itself to all of the same kind of notions, and there you have it as well being applied to someone in your own community. Mr. Bernays, by the way, was hired. He wasn't just a professor. He was a very wealthy man because he was hired by the tobacco companies. These are the ads created by Mr. Bernays, who is the father of modern propaganda. You may not remember these, but these were the ads that said doctors love this kind of stuff. <laughs> doctors smoke cigarettes of this brand more than any others. What's different about today? Well, today, instead of saying more doctors smoke camels, it would now say more doctors smoke marijuana. And you know what? Whether you agree or disagree, it's still propaganda because it's still being inserted into your brain that this is the way it's done and you should think the same thing. We know from the disclosures made by Edward Snowden and by WikiLeaks that almost every digital communication, every smartphone call, text message, post all of your medical records, wireless security systems, nanny cam recorders, every click and view and hover is being intercepted, harvested, and if not actually read, it's being stored, it's being archived, where it later can be called up and reviewed if you or you or you do something bad at that some point in the future, in which case it can be pulled up. And you're supposed to say at this point, wait a minute, Mr. Reisler, I thought you talked about that great penumbra about the Bill of Rights and privacy. Whatever happened to Justice Douglas? And I say, well, that penumbra is still there, but watch out for the solar eclipse. Your constitutional rights, the Supreme Court has held, are not absolute. You can actually waive them and they can be limited. And this, for example, is a free speech zone at the 2004 Democratic Party convention in New York City. You remember these? They were behind barbed wire and chicken wire fences. So you could exercise our freedom of speech, but you were behind a barrier. Second, in our political and economic system, there is something almost equal to, if not superior to, individual rights and liberties, and that is Freedom of contract. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, in these United States, you can voluntarily agree by contract 
to limit, waive, restrict, and otherwise completely obliterate your constitutional privacy rights, and you do it every single day of your life, almost every hour of the day. So let me assure you, first off, that with certain almost insignificant exceptions, every contract you enter into with a bank, an ISP, or a credit card company, and every website you have ever visited, by and large, ask you to enter into contracts and agreements that you are just clicking on and saying, yes, 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 I agree, I agree. Not that I'm telling you to read these things, but it doesn't matter. Because you are voluntarily agreeing to yield your own personal rights and liberties and to agree to whatever conditions they are imposing on them. And it doesn't matter whether you've actually read them or if you actually understand them. Because you're clicking on the fact that you have read them and you're saying that you understand them, and you're saying that you agree to them. To be fair, there's a good reason why you don't actually read these terms of service. There's actually a study done by some folks over at Carnegie Mellon, and that is the cost, $781 billion on an annual basis for a study done in 2008. Okay, we're now nine years later. The number of terms of services that you're running into on a daily basis is probably at least double that amount. And there's another freaky thing to notice is that I always believe you should go back and check original sources. I encourage you to do the same. Never take the word of whatever you're seeing written or published. Julian Assange says the same thing. Go back to the original source. What did it actually say? So I tried to find this study, and what you end up doing is I end up encountering Mendeley, which is a privatized research management tool run by our friends at Elsevier, it's a paywall. You can't get there. You can't get to the original data. Worse, the privacy rules and the privacy agreements that you are signing on to <coughs> can change. And they do change almost on a daily basis. There's a company called Nuance for example, which does a, runs a lot of speech recognition software, and their information policy posted on their website says, if in the future we change our policy, we will post the new privacy policy on our website. We encourage you to periodically check this privacy policy. And the, and the courts in this country say, that's fine. That means that even though you've agreed to the contract, you have to go back and see if the contract has changed because you have also agreed on all of these contracts to a provision. Look at your credit card agreements. They say the same thing. Mm -hmm. That they're allowed to unilaterally change the language of the contract that you just agreed to. And the courts have said, well, you know, uh, commerce would collapse if we found that that was unfair. And in fact, the Western District Federal Court of Washington, Judge Kuhnauer having written the opinion, said in the terms of a case involving Amazon Prime, that every time you click on a website to make a purchase, you're agreeing to a new set of agreements and contracts. And so they said, true, when you started out as a member of this program, and let's say, I won't use Amazon Prime, but some shopping, some shopping utility, the, the rules and the contract might have said X, but six months later, when you're making more purchases, it's changed. But when you clicked on it, you agreed to the terms of the contract as they existed at that time. And it may be radically different than what you started out with. And the court says, caveat emptor. That's your problem. And the fact that you didn't read it, you know, the 500-page document, uh, that is your problem. And so my illustration here is now where you are, and this is an assortment of screws. <coughs> Which brings us now to the question of, does any of this truly matter? And so now we introduce ourselves to finally we're at the topic of the talk, right? We do things backwards because I'm a lawyer, right? <laughs> this is Barbie. This is a toy doll supposedly suitable for little girls from the age of three and up. Barbie is interactive. She talks to you, you talk to her. And this is Kayla. It's called My Friend Kayla. Kayla will understand and speak in various languages and various cultures and ethnicities. You can get here in every kind of hair color, ethnicity, and attire you want. So every cultural group all around the world can have little my friend Kayla's in their home talking to your daughters and having them interact with you. 
Unfortunately, Barbie and Kayla are Trojan dolls. They are listening devices. My friend Kayla, that's this young person, has actually been banned by a federal agency in Germany as a listening device because anything that a child says in the company of this will be picked up and broadcast back to a third party processing entity and it's all done through Wi-Fi and it's not known exactly what's happening. You're, yes, you're correct in your, in your, ex your explanation. <laughs> that was mine as well and it's also worse because it has a Bluetooth faculty as well and Norwegian researchers have shown that at a distance of up to 200 meters away someone can actually hack into the doll and can be talking to your daughter your four or five year old daughter and of course your daughter doesn't know what's going on it sounds like this is Kayla I'm your best friend tell me all your secrets how about if you do this and your daughter may do this and of course this is possibly being run by someone down in a car down on the street in Germany if you have one of these dolls you are required to destroy it and certify its destruction now, I ask you a question truth in advertising Let's suppose instead of my friend Kayla, they were marketing a toy that says, my friend James Comey, my <laughs> FBI friend James Comey. He talks, he listens to whatever your kids say, he has interactive conversations with your children. You want to buy one? <laughs> How do these toys work? Well, we talked about that. Very nice. And speaking of nice, have you ever heard of telephone service center calls that start with, this call may be recorded for quality and training purposes. By the way, in the state of Washington, unlike almost every other state, we're a two-party consent state. You want to shut down those kind of calls? You interrupt immediately and you say, hold on. In Washington, we are required to have two-party consent. Not only the speaker has to consent to a recording of a call, but so does the listener on the other end. So you just tell them, I'm sorry, you do not have the right to record this conversation. I'm in the state of Washington. Done. Because it's a gross misdemeanor if they pursue it after uh, you tell them not. That's in the state of Washington. I don't have the citation to the statute. What if you want help with whatever device you're calling in for? You've got a big problem. <laughs> so, uh, so long as I'm in the Washington yeah. and the, the, the call center yeah. elsewhere still have the same... You're right. long as it, well, no, that becomes more complicated, but it still shuts them down because often they don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in fact, that is the rule. Now, you, by the way, you don't do that either. Public places like this, it doesn't matter. But in terms of a conversation on a wired phone call at a minimum, it's, and I think all personal conversations, you shut it down. But why are they telling you on these things that this call may be recorded for quality and training purposes? Training what? What are they training? You always assume they're training their staff. Well, there's a company called NICE. They specialize in telephone voice recording, data security, surveillance, as well as systems that analyze this information from their website. They tell you to seize the power of unseen data. NICE's total voice of the customer solution enables enterprises to listen to and register what customers are saying directly and indirectly across multiple channels and analyze the interactions to extract implicit feedback data, including actionable insights into customers' thoughts that are not normally included and available in surveys. You're in the world of the Internet of Things. From the Wall Street Journal, they were talking about the rise of the smart city, where smartphone apps in the hands of residents and city workers give cities new and powerful ways to expand their data collection efforts. Are you feeling better now? <laughs> Thank goodness there are federal agencies like the FDA, Department of Agriculture, and the FCC that they are there to protect <coughs> the companies that they regulate, <laughs> not you. I did a little research on marketing to children. Now, bear in mind, you have to be very careful if you do a search that says marketing children <laughs> in the same line because you could get sucked into the dark web so fast and, and I would leave a record that I would not want anybody to see but I did this very carefully. I once heard a joke from an FBI agent um, and let me tell you it's a spooky thing to hear an FBI agent telling jokes because they're not funny. <laughs> and he said um, the dark web is the place where all the men are men, all the women are men, and all the children are FBI agents. In Canada, 
In Canada, you cannot market to children. In Quebec, it's banned. Sweden and Norway bans all advertising to children on television. In the US, they're a commodity. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. I'm reading from Edward Bernays again. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast members of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together in a smoothly functioning society. Maybe you don't want a smoothly functioning society. We won't have time to go through the majority of this, but I will tell you that surveys have shown that when posted or given the opportunity to decide whether they want things like sharing health information, surprisingly a majority of people say okay. Slightly less people think it's okay <laughs> if they're sharing their loyalty cards, but still quite a few. These are their your branded credit cards. Auto insurance, now all of a sudden you start getting close <laughs> to people's cars, they start backing away a little bit. But this has to do with putting monitors and interactive uh, Wi-Fi in your cars. Do you think that's a good idea if you get cheaper insurance? Well, I say no too. Smart thermostats, you think that's a good idea or not? City of Seattle, by the way, is now in the process of ramming through its smart electric meters in every home in Seattle. Why are they doing this? They say they're doing this to make it more efficient. They're really doing it so they can lay off the meter readers, so that they can get rid of having to pay people to do the work. We're circling back to the beginning. This is Henny Youngman, dead. He was a stand-up comedian, did a lot of one-liners. You know his one-liners. A woman goes into the doctor and says, Doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, then don't do this. It applies also to you in terms of your privacy. Another one-liner is a man goes into the doctor and says, Doctor, doctor, I, I've broken my leg in two places. And the doctor replies, well, then maybe you shouldn't go to those places. <laughs> and I will leave you from the wisest of them all, which is Walt Kellogg, his very well-known Pogo cartoon. We have the answer to the question, which is what to do about the privatization of privacy. The answer lies in the acknowledgment that we have brought this on ourselves. We, you, me, the lawyers, the intelligent, the tech savvy, the computer gurus, the software engineers, the well-paid employees, the servants of capital, have unwittingly and wittingly and perhaps uncaringly, in a chain of unintended consequences, brought us a brave new world of Trojan Barbie dolls and your friend, Carla. Privacy is not dead, but it's being beaten to death. And as Pogo said, we have met the enemy, and he is us. We're going to be thrown out. Thank you for your patience.